thank you very much. <laughs> so, Bill, and yeah, we are once again on time perfectly, and we have 45 minutes to discuss. So, I have already two persons on the list, but please uh, raise your hand so that I can see you if you want to make questions. And I would really encourage also students to make questions. So it's the last opportunity you have here wonderful scholars, many of them will leave Tallinn already in the few next days, so it's really a great opportunity. So I will check my list. First, it was Massimo, I think. Yeah, please. Now, <clears throat> I, would like to I would like to address Michelle Everson's paper as announced already to her in the break. I think uh, Michelle gave us a eulogy, a celebration, a beautiful picture of ordo liberalism that I have really uh, difficulty to understand. I don't recognize ordo liberalism in your picture, first of all. So we'll see that. <laughs> Ordo Libre is a big issue, is a big issue. A bit technical too, but I don't think anything you said about Ordo Liberalism reflects what Ordo Liberalism actually is. And also I have a problem about why you say that, because I don't understand. I understand if I, that you have, let's say, more or less a redistributive agenda and that you are in favor of social rights, or welfare state, on democracy, you are democratic. You are for more democracy now. Now, all the liberalism was exactly against social rights, against welfare state, and yes, and yes, and <laughs> against democracy, against democracy. I would like to read you Two excepts, so to understand, we understand each other better perhaps, so we can just do, it's a long, of course this is a very, it's a long discussion, but uh, now. First of all, speech of Mario Draghi, president of the European Central Bank, at the farewell conference of honoring <laughs> Governor Stanley Fischer, Jerusalem, 18th of, Jan of June, 2013. It is worth recalling, this is Mario Draghi speaking, it's not me. It's, not, it's worth recalling the, the monetary constitution of the ECB is firmly, firmly grounded in the principles of ordo liberalism, particularly two of its central tenets. First, a clear separation of power and objectives between authorities, and second, adherence to the principles of an open market economy with free competition, favoring and efficient allocations, allocation of resources. Our policy is concerned only with macroeconomic stabilization through the pursuit of price stability. We do not and should not play an active role in the functions of allocation and distribution. Okay, what does it mean? What is actually ordoliberalism? Liberalism is in two words. Ordoliberalism comes from the assessment that capitalism, traditional capitalism, Manchesterian capitalism, free market, unbounded capitalism, does not work. And this is clear after the 29 crisis in Wall Street and so on, so on, what happens. But they believe in capitalism. They still say capitalism is the only efficient system to have, good, to have prices, for the formation of prices, and also for allocation. Allocation cannot be given to design, to human design. Citizens cannot be decide about allocations of resources. Only markets can, can decide about allocation of resources, okay. But markets left to them alone will fail. So what should we do? Very simple, great. We should monitor market. We should monitor market. 
we should uh, use, um, constitute a police, police, policing of markets given to organs that, however, are not placed in the hands of citizens. So democracy, politics, will never put their hands on economy. Economy will be completely managed through markets, but under the supervision of us. That means of people establishing fundamentally competition law. Competition law is fundamentally a product of auto liberalism. So we don't want democracy interfering with the economy because we call democracy interfering in economy leads to disaster. We cannot rely on democracy. We shouldn't rely on democracy. So we take economy out of democracy because democracy will lead to disaster. Democracy will be, be feeding too much needs, too much interest, too much desires, too much rights, pluralism, social problems, unions claims. This will be a disaster. We don't want that. We stop this. Markets should be cut off from politics through authority, through authoritarian intervention. So they are for market, but they are not for democracy. This is absolutely this is absolutely ordo liberals. And ordo liberals were coquetting, some of them, Franz Böhm, with Nazi regime. Okay, in the end, in 44, also many people from the Wehrmacht, many people from the Prussian elite in the 44 revolted against Nazi. But till 44, till 40, till 40, Franz Böhm, Franz Böhm, was, I read things written by Franz Bohm, so I can tell you. They, there are writings by Franz Bohm saying good things about the Führer. We need the Führer, and so on, and so on, and so on. So please, they were not, don't, don't picture them as liberals, democratic, cosmopolitans. They were nothing of this. Thank you. Uh, if I can ask, uh, okay, I will take two more. So I will take two more. Uh, but if I can ask, yeah, please brief statements maybe and, and questions. So it will be uh, Paulina, please. I promise to just ask a question. Very good. <laughs> Thank you. In, in fact, if any student wants to take my question, I'd be very willing to give it to them. No? Okay, now, if you, if you are simply asking questions, please ask okay, your so question. Okay, so this is my then, question. I think this we have is time a question for, for John Keane. Yeah. What does Vaginilla Lands do for you? What, what does it add, Vaginilla Lands? I mean, what the, I mean the, the things that I saw that are distinctive to him, you did not mention. He, 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 wants, to, he wants to manage race, the paradocracia. You didn't even mention that. So what, what does he do for you? Marilise, please. Hi, thank you. I've uh, also got a question with a brief comment. Uh, I target you to John, Leif and uh, Bill because you talked about the issue, but the others feel free to comment on it as well. Uh, I want to ask about the, um, the people who actually also participate in the markets, but to whom you reference to as citizens and participants in the civil society. So the question is really simple and really hard to answer. What role for civil society do you see? And my concerns I would like you to comment on are, are the following. It would be very interesting uh, if John and Leif commented on, uh, on Bill's uh, presentation. Uh, but if I take from the Estonian um, experience, um, I mean, it's, it's not, I would say that civil society is not just a knight in shining armor, it is also the kind of the victim of the, the antagonist for, for the populists. So here as well we see some attempts, and elsewhere we've seen way bigger attempts to kind of curb the uh, opportunities for the civil society to actually do something, curb their courage, etc. And I would say that this kind of uncivil disobedience, and even in some cases civil disobedience, is just like, you know, 
uh, water that turns the, <laughs> uh, the, the the turning wheel for for the populist, because then they can show that you know there is a serious antagonist. They are threatening the good moral people who are also tame, so to say. And uh, overall, I mean, in in most societies the majority of people are not actually for this kind of radical opposition and they can also kind of turn their backs to the civil society in case you use very radical measures. All right, thank you. Okay, so thank you. I think Michelle first of all. Uh, that's it. Yeah, I didn't, I, I thought this is a hostage to fortune using the Ordo Liberals because I don't want to be here to, to defend the Ordo Liberals. As I say, I am not... Um, an economic liberal. However, at the same time, yes, huge critiques to be made of them, but I wouldn't, I also wouldn't overstate the critique. Actually, translate, Berm has always driven me up the wall. The 35 manifesto really annoys me. There's an arrogance in the post war literature as well. Um, in terms of uh, uh, the, the first American anti-cartel provisions that were put in place by the Control Commission and his part in it, and you, you, you see a hypocrisy in what he writes there, a pretense that he was, he, was, he was a bigger fighter against the Nazis than he was. But at the same time, and especially that stuff where he works with the Führer, between the lines there is a critique of the war. That's, and at that stage, you have to say, yes, these are people who are reacting, who are reacting to a situation of oppression. How do you react, whether it's the civil or the uncivil disobedience? And in the notion of powerlessness in the economy, I want to see power, I want to see redistribution, but I will still recognize the quality of that idea that no one should be allowed through amassing power to determine people's lives in the economy. And I think that that is something which I will support, yes? And I will also take them as the challenge. It's been the joke, and I, I, I come back, uh, you mentioned Draghi and the ECB, and I come back, I have heard over the last few years the biggest load of rubbish about ordo liberals. Um, someone like Anne Pettifer, who is someone who I, really appreciate from the left side a massive critique of ordo liberalism which isn't ordo liberalism there is no ordo liberal writing on central banks there is one paragraph by boom this is it this there is a rhetoric there is a rhetoric of ordo liberalism created in terms of the bank in terms of the german constitutional court the reality of ordo liberalism is very different in, in that they just weren't interested. They weren't interested. It was too, it's, it's something that develops after them. Maybe they would have been extreme. Maybe they would have been, but it doesn't mean they were. But to come back, I think, to, to the reason I am using them, it is that challenge. As I say, Anne, Anne Pettifer, in one breath, she'll dismiss the Ordo Liberals, and the next breath, she'll talk about the constitution of a global economy, the constitution of a global economy with economic constraints being the constitutive form. It is the same structure. You're talking about constituting economy, setting the limits. We can disagree with their setting of the limits, but if we're using the same constitutive forms, yeah, then, you know, this is the challenge, and this is, this is why I use them. This is why I find them, for all that I'm not an ordo liberal, why I find them really rather, yes, useful and challenging. But I'll stop there. <laughs> so, John, I think. Uh, well, um, uh, Paulina's uh, question is uh, apposite because it so happened that at the very moment that um, Daniela handed me the five minute warning, I just <laughs> jumped over the most central point of the lecture and forgot to say it. Uh, so uh, you are puzzled by why uh, Vianila uh, lands. What I wanted to say as a thought experiment was to uh, put on the table, uh, ideal typically, two forms of contemporary populism. And I wanted to say that Max Weber and Loriano Vainia Lanz um, are helpful in 
um, in conceptualizing these forms. What I didn't say um, a word about is the relationship in these early years of the 21st century between these two forms. Um, I sided, so to say, with Max Weber by saying that um, in uh, parliamentary electoral processes of representative government, there is, as was understood in the 18th century, there is the, the constant danger that there will be an objection to representation, this is Nadia Urbanati and others, and in the name of the people, a form of, of politics, electoral politics, will arise that I tried to describe as populism. And that is clearly going on in uh, more than a few actually existing electoral democracies. I also wanted to say, with the help of uh, Loriano Vainia, that um, it may come as a surprise and you may object to the overstretch of the term, uh, but there is a species, um, a subtype of contemporary populism which I described as state-managed uh, populism. Uh, what I didn't say anything about was uh, the similarities between these two. They share, actually, uh, some organizing uh, principles. For instance, leaders in both uh, electoral populist uh, phenomenon and state uh, managed populism um, constantly go on about the people. They describe themselves as uh, closer to democracy or taking the whole polity towards democracy. Both of them uh, dislike flanking accountability, monetary institutions. And one of the structural features of these new despotisms is that they largely destroy independent judiciaries and independent media. Um, uh, they don't have um, independent freestanding anti-corruption commissions. What I wanted, um, what I also wanted to say, but didn't, um, thanks to the guillotine, is to make a few remarks which I develop at length in this new book of the entanglement of these two, empirically. You know, um, the, uh, the friendliness of the United States to Saudi Arabia. Uh, you, you know, I could multiply the examples exponentially to show that actually there's a sort of structural interdependence of these two types of 21st century uh, phenomena to do with populism. And then finally, here's the sting in the tail of what I wanted to say. I wanted to say to you uh, that one thinkable pathway uh, that this electoral populism puts us on is to take us along the road towards uh, that state-managed populism. And if you think that's purely abstract hypothetical reasoning, um, actually um, Orban showed that you can do it in about a decade. And uh, when I look into the tea leaves and I look at the United States, for example, I can see that actually um, the structural features of state-managed populism, these are state capitalist regimes that, whose accountability uh, structures have been radically damaged and weakened, but which stage elections and this constant talk of the people, I can see that the United States, it's thinkable, is actually on that path. And that's pretty significant because um, uh, in my lifetime, uh, there were three democratic empires all together in the history of democracy, Athens, uh, revolutionary France, and the United States. And the United States functioned uh, as the protector of constitutional power-sharing democracy despite all of its hypocrisy. It's in decline and in the heart of the empire. This uh, dynamic is unleashed, and that is why I tried to bring together Vianne and Lance uh, in to, to kind of shock you into thinking that there might be uh, a functional dynamic interdependence of these uh, two. I mean, we will see. Okay, so I think, thank you, John, I don't want to, you have finished. 
Uh, one, one, <laughs> one, one sentence. Uh, uh, in the new book and in some of my writings, I have, in the book on China, which is uh, a warm-up for this new book, uh, the China book is called When Trees Fall, Monkeys Scatter. It's a Chinese proverb. I coined the phrase phantom democracy. Um, it's, a, it's a technical term. Phantom is uh, it's not fake. Uh, if you have a phantom pregnancy, uh, it's both real and not real. Um, if you have a phantom limb after a, uh, being victimized in war. Uh, so in China, uh, in Russia, and in Turkey, uh, there is constant reference by those who rule to democracy, and important parts of the population uh, think they live in a democracy. Uh, and it is possible that power-sharing constitutional democracies can be transformed into phantom democracies, and populism might be the key uh, agent of that transformation. That's, that's kind of what I wanted to say. And in the new book, I've tried to do an anatomy of uh, regimes otherwise as different as Saudi and Turkey and Russia and China and Vietnam and Singapore and so on. Uh, but halfway through reading the book, I try to encourage you to see that these regimes have a lot of affinities with the so-named democracies in which we live. I'll just say one thing. This, for me, is an example of... and that, that's. Yeah, so it, it, this is an example, I think, of where civil disobedience, so uh, I think we have to prefer it whenever possible. Um, why? Well, civil disobedience, there, is very strict, there are very strict publicity demands, and, and that's another way of saying that one, you know, this is a tactic one uses as part of a political movement um, where one has to justify what one's doing, one has to make a case to citizens, or, or I mean, I, I, don't, I wouldn't use that term strictly, it also could be you know, people who aren't citizens, but to your political peers. And one of the problems, I think, with uncivil disobedience, there may be reasons why that is necessary in exceptional moments, but you, you lose that if you're engaging in secret activity, right? Um, I mean, that becomes really, or at least it's not clear how you can make the sort of argument that you can make. And, and ma saying make the argument makes it sound too rationalistic, right? So you can do civil disobedience, and the symbolic action itself, sometimes, if you do it, creatively can speak for itself. You don't have to have somebody saying, this is what we're doing and why. But that's why, I, one of the reasons why I think, yes, civil disobedience is going to be you know, what we should prefer to do. Um, but even then, you have to ask these very difficult tactical prudential questions. <clears throat> Habermas was one of the culprits who, in distinguishing between civil society as synonymous with public communication, uh, distinguished between markets, uh, state, and civil society, and I think it was a concession to neoliberalism, yeah. basically, or some version of auto-liberalism. Yeah. I dare yeah, not exactly. use this phrase. <laughs> and, and I agree, one last thing, I, I agree with, um, with you very much, uh, Marilis, that um, the uh, uh, melalatria urbinati, the, the outgrouping of this populism in it necessarily involves a destruction of uh, uh, some civilities and a destruction of the pluralism of a rich, robust civil society. You pick on Muslims, or you pick on LGBT, or you pick on women, or you know, disabled. It depends on the context. So the defense of civil society as uh, an important uh, feature, ethically, practically, strategically, uh, of democracy, um, the, the defense of civil society is fundamental, I think, in, in the resistance to populism. But that leaves the property question, as it used to be put, open, and I think that what is very interesting uh, in support of this older uh, understanding of civil society is that there are initiatives, Michelle mentioned some, I would add, um, where there is an attempt a la Polanyi, to find ways of re-embedding predatory, uh, risk-taking, profit-oriented corporate power, of re-embedding it in civil society relations. That uh, practically means not only uh, uh, governmental regulation, uh, 
but it also means the, from below the development of experiments. You mentioned uh, cooperatives and so on. I, I would say, just to mention some examples, and I stop, uh, De Correspondent is a very successful Dutch initiative, uh, crowdsourced. Um, it's a really important uh, media platform that doesn't do breaking news, that is embedded in the civil society, that wants to protect it against uh, populism, is a case in point. I do think basic income schemes that are uh, happening at city level uh, is potentially one of the universalist uh, innovations of this uh, great moment of disruption. That populism, ironically, might, with a bit of luck, uh, be credited later by historians as having, having helped uh, basic income schemes to take root. In the same way, so to summarize, you know, um, uh, finding ways of uh, re-embedding commodity production and exchange in social relations that are plural and where civility and civil disobedience happen uh, is important. And here, uh, one last historical comparison to stop. Um, in the United States, the, the eruption of populism from the 18, late 60s and 70s um, frightened parts of the establishment, corporate and, and political establishment. And out of this came progressivism. And progressivism um, managed to absorb, so to say, the, 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 the anger of the populists and produce new policies that had a lot to do with the social uh, taming of markets. Um, the eight-hour working day. Um, the uh, legal defense of trade unions, the direct enfranchisement of women and the direct, direct votes for the Senate were among the reforms that actually took the sting out of uh, that American populism and produced long-lasting consequences. I think a political question in this period is, is something analogous to that going to happen this time round? I think it's very early to say it looks uh, who said this using the S-H-I-T word? Yes, um, uh, yes, life. You know, we are in deep S-H-I-T. Uh, we, we are, and you say it's a matter of, in, uh, matter of perspective, which didn't encourage me very much. But, uh, but it, is, it is, I think, thinking historically about this and not, not ignoring the property, commodity production and exchange question because... Um, on balance, it looks like this new populism, um, on balance, all things considered, favors plutocracy. Yes. I understand civil society broadly in terms of uh, the space for citizen engagement of various kinds. And in some ways, yes, populist engagement could also be conceived as a citizen engagement of some kind. But uh, if we take some, let's say, more nuanced uh, approaches, for example, Michael Edwards defines uh, civil society in terms of uh, both uh, associational sphere uh, public uh, sphere and um, civility. Here, of course, stronger style populists are lacking. They don't uh, share this uh, vision of civility, most likely. They want to redefine it. And then it somehow develops into a question to how long, to what extent, you can be tolerant towards uh, the intolerant. Um, but I would like also to emphasize uh, this second aspect of um, these populist strategies being in very moderate amounts parts of most of the political strategies. And also various civic associations or individual citizens uh, sometimes take on colorful acts. Um, um, be they protecting animals, promoting some kind of idea, book, whatever. 
And uh, this way, uh, this very light uh, populism uh, uh, strategy to gain attention is uh, one of the crucial parts of uh, 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 successful civil society. So there are different dimensions in this. I would like to address my, my question to Professor Schurman. Uh, I have two, two questions, actually. Um, the first one is related to the um, justifiability of uh, uncivil disobedience. There are some studies and uh, some empirical basis. I'm, I'm referring explicitly to the NAVCO data set of Erika Chenoweth, which shows how nonviolent campaign of a uh, possibility to success, which is much, much higher in respect to violent campaign. But what's important also is that the rate of democratization of a country after this campaign, if it is violent, it's much, much lower. So nonviolent campaign have the possibility to create a society which is democratic in a much higher probability. So the question is, is the following. Should we start to switch thinking about what is justify, justify, just what can we justify and start to think about efficiency on, on, on the actions of violent, uh, civil or uncivil disobedience? And the second question is related to the fact that you took for granted that uh, Democrats and liberal thinkers accept civil disobedience as something that, which is good and healthy for the society. And I would like to point out a recent case and ask you why do you think that this is not the case. So there is uh, a political movement which is called Extinction Rebellion, which for sure the, um, the people from the UK know. And um, they are mainly a political movement which use nonviolent civil disobedience um, to halt max extinction, to minimize the risk of social collapse due to the climate emergency. And uh, they do so in the really classical and civil way as you described. What's actually happening is that in the public opinion debate, they are not seen uh, as you described them. So there are even Democrats and liberals who are saying they are not um, doing the right thing because mainly due to the uh, high level of disruption that they are causing. So they are doing it in the, in the most peaceful way using cr creative staffs and accepting the judgments of the courts and uh, collaborating with the police, so really in the traditional way that you showed us at the beginning. Why do you think that the Democrats and liberals here are not valuing what this movement is doing? Thank you. Yes, um, well, my question about the civil and uncivil disobedience, I was wondering, could you cite some examples where uncivil disobedience has achieved its goals, as historically we know that civil disobedience did, uh, for example, you mentioned uh, Gandhi and uh, uh, Martin Luther King Jr. By the way, I myself experienced that era, and uh, but there was also violence uh, associated with it. But it was a very ad admirable movement of uh, civil rights in the United States. I lived in the Deep South at the time, and yes, so as I said, I, I lived through that. Do we have examples of? achieving through uncivil disobedience uh, the goals. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for your uh, clear presentations. I would have two brief questions uh, to Mart Susi and William Scheuermann. Uh, first, um, Mats uh, Zuzi, uh, my question relates to your no, uh, to which I agree. There is no self-standing uh, right uh, to populism. Uh, in fact, it can be uh, part of the right to free expression or uh, to free speech, fr freedom of speech. 
But um, where comes your, uh, how do you justify uh, your very limited uh, concept of human rights? I mean, um, there is a broad discussion if we don't make inflationary use of the term human rights and the idea of human rights, and there are several attempts to uh, limit them. Um, but uh, is your limitation not a bit too narrow and you would skip out uh, at least the last generation of human rights? Um, and the second question goes to William Scheuermann. How Again, um, how is the normative justification of acts of uncivil disobedience? Um, is it legitimacy because of the results um, and a substantive uh, conviction of what is good for a society? Or do, you, do they attempt uh, a more procedural, discursive legitimation? Um, and if so, what is the group that participates in these legitimizing discourses? We we'll take the last one, so over there, so, so that we will have a last, uh, final so round of answers to. So please, um, Max uh, Horkheimer. Whoever is uh, silent about capitalism should also be quiet about populism. I paraphrase. I'm glad that John raised the uh, issue of plutocracy because, yes, it, to some extent it is a, a matter of perspective. For the top 1%, things are working pretty fine. Capitalism is working exactly as it's meant to be. Um, but my question is for, for William. <laughs> Bill, 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 Bill. What, what's happened to the Bill of old who would have integrated his analysis precisely with a, a material critique of capitalism, of inequality, and this poses the broader question, why restrict disobedience to disobedience against um, right-wing populism, you know, tough on populism, tough on the causes of populism, to, to paraphrase uh, an, uh, an old British leader that we're familiar with. Um, and the question is a serious one, because the yellow vests in France, are they protesting against right-wing populism? They're pro protesting against Macron. The Ferguson demonstrations, which you yourself used, took place under Obama, not under Trump. Uh, so um, wh why, why, why restrict this to um, um, uh, analysis of a disobedience against right-wing populism? After all, Martin Luther King became a threat, a serious threat, to the US establishment when he started talking about capitalism and class conflict. Thanks. Uh, the privilege of being caught in the uh, shutdown, literally in the shutdown of the largest airport in the world. I happened to be there at the time. And uh, I have written quite a lot on Hong Kong, and it obviously has much to do with this new despotism problem. It's probably at the moment um, the most globally important um, civil disobedience that has, um, that has hybridity in which I then subsequently watched uh, in the following days uh, how it works. So how it works is that late at night after yet another demonstration uh, in defense of the five demands which touch on questions of property and in social and economic injustice, uh, no free and fair elections, we don't want to become yet another Chinese city, etc. cetera. Um, there begins to be words hurled at the police who are frighteningly armed, and um, they spit back, and then the firing begins and the missiles are projected, the typical pattern is that the crowd then draws back uh, and from a distance uh, urges on those who are fighting the police. And what is astonishing, it's called batkotsek, uh, no mat cutting. We will not be divided by you. So there is, and it, I never saw anything like this. It, it violates, uh, pun, no pun intended, that uncivil, civil disobedience, 
Uh, astonishing is the way that the population of Hong Kong remained thoroughly solid uh, in support of that dynamic. And this is not finished business, and one of its interesting features is the way that it ebbs and flows, uh, and memories are kept alive, and there's going to be more trouble without any doubt at all. And I think the coronavirus actually deepens this sense that we will not, we will not be swallowed by this uh, despotism. And I, I wanted to make one remark to, to Bill. I do think that um, you like history. I, I would say that uh, the whole question, the theorization of civil disobedience is time, it has a, a strong time boundedness. I, I, a couple of years ago, read Thoreau's essay on civil. I thought it was so uh, tame. Uh, it's 1849, I think. It's sort of like, wow, it's so boring. It's like, that's not what I have in mind. And I, and, and I, think, I think there is a history of civil disobedience. And it's maybe um, the Hong Kong case, I mention it because... It stretches, it stretches the space-time parameters, the, so to say, the, um, the rhetorical you know, symbolism of, of, and the power dynamics of what civil disobedience comprises, it seems to me. Um, you dodge the question, finally, about um, legitimacy, norms. You know, and I, I think um, perhaps one way of replying is to say that it's not possible to develop a trigonometry or an algebra of civil disobedience that applies to every context. Every context requires judgments, that's politics, that's democracy, uh, and uh, the question of violence is central, one last comment, because um, violence, the Hong Kongese um, typically do not see the violation of property as violence. Killing another, destroying the subject, is anti-democratic by definition. And so it has, to be, it has to be handled extremely carefully. And if you put to young Hong Kongese, Chairman Mao's you know, famous statement, political power grows out of the barrel of the gun, they laugh riotously at the absurdity of it. Uh, so um, uh, the, the, the question of violence is in a way the quintessential, I mean, defining it, it's the quintessential problem, so to say, in the civil disobedience. If you are in favor of democracy, you are uh, in favor of um, no arbitrary power, uh, its dispersion, uh, check and balance, respect for complexity and so on, and a defense of civil society. And, and, that, and it follows from that normative pluralism that you uh, must be in favor of moments when civil disobedience happens to disrupt um, arbitrary power and to prefigure the world now, as you so beautifully put it. Okay, so thank you very much to all. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> yeah, a short one. Yeah, yeah, please. <laughs> More disobedience. <laughs> it does Since I like we are in Estonia, <laughs> talk about civil disobedience, and your uh, remark about Hong Kong made me think of it. In this country, I'm Estonian American, so I can also say in this country we had civil disobedience and we sang ourselves free without violence. And it was totally, constantly emphasized. Moscow wants violence. We are not going to engage in that because they want a big, big show. And it was amazing. Yeah. On this very land. I, I wish I had been there. I, I, no, no, I mean that. I actually wish I had. And I, you know, I learned to think about this through, um, I mean, I translated and uh, edited Václav Havel's first book in English, Power, The Power of the Powerless, which is a tract, one of the great tracts mm -hmm. right. uh, of the 20th century in defense of civil disobedience. Yeah, that's right, it is, yeah. Uh, and the whole idea is that violence is a trap. Mm -hmm. uh, it has to be handled extremely carefully. Right, um, right. The regime would like us to be violent as... Beijing wants violence to erupt and be uh, a kind of cancer of Hong Kong. Uh, but the whole idea is that you can transform power relations within um, any situation through a cup of coffee or a conversation with a friend or forming an independent trade union. And uh, it redefines what power means, what politics means, 
uh, and it's intrinsically related to the civil disobedience question. Right. It is, I think, one of the great tracks. I don't know if it's translated into Estonian, but do read it. It's 100 pages of beautiful writing in defense of uh, right. Bill's, mm -hmm. uh, Bill's uh, reflections, I would say. Yeah. So I think it's really good that we have moved uh, in this conference from uh, very uh, theoretical so kind of uh, approaches to this kind of very gloomy so scenarios, but at the end, uh, really, there's uh, yeah some light about uh, very concrete ways of uh, answering to this very old question: what has to be done? So that um, yeah, thank you very much to all the speakers. Thank you very much to the audience, and I am really glad to give the floor now to. Professor Indra Krauberg for concluding words of the conference. So it has been uh, two days of uh, very interesting academic discussion, very challenging also sometimes uh, because I was also sitting in the front row here and I one time even smell a smoke in the air, I mean actual smoke in the air. So uh, this means that um, we had a very good and hard debate also. Um, actually, I have prepared uh, my speech for one and a half hours, uh, but um, I think that um, I'll skip that uh, because I think everybody I, are already diet and it's a Valentine's Day, so everybody's thinking about having a nice dinner and glass of wine together with friends. But um, there are certain people I would like especially thank. Uh, first of all, I think we all need to give a round of applause, Professor Massimo Latorre, who has been a heart and a soul of this event. And then, of course, uh, you. No, 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 no. This, this is. I'm, 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 I'm nobody. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm not that. Uh, I'm, I'm not uh, here because of that. <laughs> but of course, uh, the people who has worked behind the scenes, uh, and uh, special thanks to Marlene, who has been a heart of a soul of the organizing this event. Also assisting Kathleen and our students uh, from the Student Union Civitas who have helped us during the discussions with microphones and everything else here. Yeah. <laughs> then uh, also French Institute who has even helped us uh, financially to organize this event, and I'm really sure that this cooperation will continue further with the next events. I think we can call this now even a kind of a series of, of conferences already, because it's the fourth time we are, we are here in, um, in uh, Tallinn doing, doing such a high-level uh, academic uh, uh, event. And I'm absolutely pleased that we have managed again to uh, uh, bring here to, to to welcome here in Estonia such a high level uh, scholars and without whom this whole event wouldn't be possible. So thank you, thank you all for coming. <laughs> and Massimo was showing me that these 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 kinds of moves. Uh, this means that um, I, I understood what does that mean. This means that. Um, we actually want to publish a book out of this conference. But there is always a problem with this uh, book. That we, we always have, we always want to have a book. But, 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 but people doesn't provide us with the written forms of their presentation or articles. And we have had a small, you know, jokes even, what kind of measures we, we should use to get out uh, those um, 
those uh, papers. But, well, I'm not going to tell these jokes now, but, um, but, uh, but seriously, we would really appreciate if you could send us the written versions. And, and there have been already some talks with, with publishers also who, who I think should be interested of, of such kind of uh, high-level conference and the book out of such kind of high-level uh, academic discussion. So I hope we manage this time. And I'm pretty sure it will be very useful reading for the whole academic community in the world. Thank you all, and have a pleasant night and pleasant time in Estonia. Thank you.